Oh wait, did it go? It just, there's a slight lag. I'm just waiting on it. I'm looking at his page right now. I don't see the red button. I know. Just give it, there's always like a couple there seconds. Thank you. Now we're on. Do you see it now? Yeah. We're on, we are on, Julie. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your exchange's senior enlisted advisor. I am super pumped today. Not only do I have great co-hosts, but we also have a super guest. It's big. We got today Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, one of my co-hosts. We got Julie Mitchell and Leah Matthews. And then, of course, we got two Puerto Ricans that are, could be on the air today. So I don't know <laughs> if this is going to last long. We might get shut down. <laughs> I'm not sure, not sure what's going to happen, everyone, but it's going to be fun. So before we get to our guests, Chief, Leah, Judy, how are you doing today? Doing great. Good to see you. Awesome. Hello, right. everybody. Yes, and I'm doing wonderful. This is a, this is an outstanding opportunity uh, that y'all put me in front of, so thank you. <laughs> And we also have Christiane, you wanna say hi? Hi, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, we got you on the air. I see that. <laughs> she's, the PA for, she's the PA for the SEAC in case anybody's wondering. You know, let's get right to it. Julie, you mind introducing our guest? We are truly honored to host today's guest. He is the most senior enlisted service member in the United States Armed Forces and the principal military advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on all matters involving joint and combined total force integration, utilization, health of the force, and joint development for enlisted personnel. It is our privilege to welcome this senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ramon CZ Colon Lopez. Hey! Woo! Woo! See act, see act, see act, see act, see act, see act, see See act. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. We're super excited to have you. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Share your questions for Siat Colon Lopez there. We'll read them out loud throughout the broadcast. And if you don't follow us, you should. Chief chats are every Tuesday and Thursday, sometimes two a day, like today. And if you don't follow Siat Colon Lopez, you should too. So you'll stay informed on what he's doing in his unique position to advocate for and develop enlisted service members across the joint force. Wow, what an intro. Thank you so much, Leah. We, we appreciate that. So before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit of knowledge that was brought upon me, right? SEAC is the actual duty title for the position, right? But before that, I think it was just created in between the transition between the third SEAC and the fourth SEAC. So SEAC Colon Lopez is the appropriate title. If you don't hear me, I, I might slip up and call him chief. I apologize in advance if I do, because I see the uniform. I know you're in the Air Force, but that is not the correct duty title for the SEAC. It is SEAC Colon Lopez or SEAC CZ. Is that, is that cool, SEAC? Uh, yeah, that is that is absolutely right. So very few people, you know, have have caught on to the to the actual rank change. But as of December of 2019, I went from being a chief to being a SEAC. From now on, regardless of service, whoever fills the position as a senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, their rank will change from sergeant major, from command sergeant major, from command master chief to SEAC. Wow, there we go. Hey, some nuggets. I just learned that today, everyone. So boom, <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> hey, so SEAC, uh, CZ, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. As Julie said, it truly is an honor to have you here with us today. There's a lot that's been going on in the world. 2020 has been quite a year. You took over in mid-December. So how have you been spending these past six months, particularly in light of COVID-19? We have had many challenges, uh, to say the least, and COVID hit us right in the beginning of the year. And we have been tracking as early as uh, February to uh, make sure that we're maintaining the readiness of the force and make sure that we maintain the proper footprint abroad because we still have commitments. You know, with the enemy, COVID uh, doesn't really get a vote. So we need to maintain presence out there. So readiness has been one of the main things that we have been focusing on. And that is primarily just to make sure we have the number one, the available numbers to do what we need to do. And number two, the numbers that are out there, how do we maintain them healthy and keep rotating clean forces in and out of the AOR? 
Uh, we have had to adjust quite a bit on the way that we conduct business. Some of it has been minimized, i.e. education and other things to maintain the CDC uh, rules and norms. Some other things that we have done is ways to flex those adjustments to ensure the proper execution of our mission. There are certain things that we cannot budge on, but we had to come to terms and come up with some very tough and critical thinking on how we were going to go ahead and uh, weigh the risk against the reward. And the reward is freedom. So I think that we assume quite a bit of risk in order to carry out this mission. And one of the most important things that we have been doing since the beginning of COVID is just collecting the feedback from the people. Because we all know that this pandemic has placed a lot of stress on our families. So with the help of Christy Ann and the rest of the PA team and my uh, front office, Chief Masters, Gunny Gutierrez, Sergeant uh, De La Cruz Johnson, and Master Chief uh, or Senior Chief uh, Sprayberry, we have embarked on a campaign to have our eyes and ears open via social media, requests via email, phone calls in, with the limited visits to be able to hear the voice of the people and then take those concerns straight to the top, to the chairman and the secretary of defense to make sure that we have the proper policies in place to be able to go ahead and mitigate the stress that is affecting our families. But that was the first six months in office. We'll see what the other three and a half uh, years bring, uh, bring on board. But uh, in true fashion, molo lave, come and take it. Awesome, awesome. Hey, hey Chief. Uh, see, oh, see, I already messed up already. See, <laughs> at Colon Lopez, um, for the for the our viewers that don't know much about your your military career, can you tell us a little about about that and um and also why you chose to join the military? Yeah, so for me it was pretty simple. I was uh, like many teenagers in their first year of college. Uh, I was not satisfied in my life position. Something that I noticed was that I didn't really have a purpose. My drive was towards doing the wrong things. I was having more fun than enriching my mind and studying. So one day I just decided to go by the recruiter's office and I asked him one simple question. By the way, his name was Technical Sergeant Derek Reeson. I still remember because he made a huge impact in my life by allowing me or giving me the opportunity to come into service. But he provided me some options. I told him what I needed. And next thing you know, I'm embarking uh, into basic training. So that was the beginning of it. I didn't tell my family at first and they were all shocked when I told them that I was leaving home. And they told me, well, you have everything you need here. Why do you want to leave? I was like, well, I, I really don't. I have you and you're everything to me, but you're not everything that I need in my life right now. I need to go ahead and create some independence. So I came into basic training. My English was pretty limited at the time. And half of the stuff that was yelled at me in basic training, I understood. The other half, I didn't, and I just found <laughs> out it, which just got me into trouble. But, you know, there was a, an awakening moment while I was in BMT, and that was what one of my squad leaders, basically the person that was in charge of a row of beds, got fired. And the TI came up to me and said, hey, uh, come on, Lopez, you got this. You're going to be the new squad leader. I was just like, wow, well, that's pretty neat. And then I remember writing a letter to my sister, Frances, where I told her that, hey, I was just put in a leadership position. And I think that this is something good. I mean, I, I enjoy doing this. I like getting people to do right. And I think I found a place to exist. So fast forward a little bit past that. I was a traffic management specialist when I first came into service. And it wasn't long after I got assigned to my first duty station, a Rackley on Earth station, where I started going back, reverting to my old ways of my partying ways in college. And, you know, I had an incident that happened to where I got demoted, I lost a stripe, and I almost got kicked out of the service until an NCO intervened in my career and showed me a path that I wasn't following. And uh, I ended up following him, following her advice. And next thing you know, I'm back in the United States after that tour. I, uh, I get to Randolph Air Force Base and by chance, I run into this PJ that asked me if I ever thought about doing it. You know, there was a, you know, uh, a reputation out there that I had a, lot, a little bit too much energy. So this guy sought me out and uh, he asked me, well, I didn't know anything about pararescue. Um, so I told him, yeah, right, that sounds cool. Skydiving, shooting guns, uh, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> scuba diving, great. What he didn't tell me was about the pain that I had to endure for two years in order to wear the maroon beret. And uh, I went in there totally blind, 142 pounds wet, 
uh, I wasn't anywhere near an operator in physique. I was more like an Olsen twin. And uh, <laughs> I got uh, I got in there, you know, and I was pretty intimidated seeing, you know, the demographic. I mean, you had, you know, Johnny football heroes from high school and uh, guys in pretty great shape. But uh, what uh, what I what I saw was that people had alternate reasons for being there. Some of them just wanted to say that they tried. Some of them were not really sure whether they wanted it. For me, man, there was no options. I was still trying to find the purpose in my life. And once I graduated and, comp and completed the pipeline, my life was defined. I knew what my purpose in this lifetime was, and I embraced it ever since. So I haven't worked a day since there. Then shortly after that, I met my bride, Janet. Uh, we got married, and we have been married uh, for over 24 years now. And you know, she's been with me all the way through multiple deployments, combat, assignment to the uh, nation's most elite unit. And she's, she's a champ. She's always been there for me. And I never had any desire to be a senior enlisted leader. But again, in life, some of the best things that happen to you are the things that you least expect. And that is exactly how I came to become a command chief first and how we are here today serving in the top enlisted billet in the entire Department of Defense. So again, it's, it's, I think that the biggest lesson that I have learned so far in this is that a reputation can carry you a long, long way. But that reputation has to be not because of word of mouth, it has to be by actions of the individual. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to serve and uh, I'm almost uh, sad that it's gonna come to an end here in three and a half years. But until that day comes, I'll keep giving it my 100% on it uh, hey, like you, you said it you said it best right you could talk the talk but can you walk the walk uh, right? at the end of the day that's what matters absolutely. but here's a here's a follow-up question can you tell me a little bit about the pararescueman creed and how that shaped your service yeah so the the creed is something that you have to learn day one and uh the more you screw it up the more push-ups or floater kicks you're <laughs> doing so but but they teach you that for a reason because it's not just something that you memorize it actually becomes a way of life and for those of you who do not know what the creed is, is it is my duty as pararescueman to save lives and aid the injured. I will be prepared at all times to perform my assigned duties quickly and efficiently, placing these duties before personal designs and comforts. These things we do that others may live. Oh yeah. So that just became my way of life, you know. And you can break that down, you know, further and further. And uh, you know, it is my duty as a pararescueman. It defines who you are, what you do. Then it defines your purpose to save, you know, my purpose is to save life and aid the injured. Number three is the expectation. I will be prepared at all times to perform my assigned duties. How? Quickly and efficiently. And for whom? Selflessness. Placing these duties before personal desires and comforts. And then your purpose in life at the end. These things we do that others may live. And that is still near and dear to me. And I apply, I apply that to everything that I do in life. So can you talk to us about your current role and what you're focused on to develop the joint force and then take care of our service members and families? No, absolutely. So when we talk about the duties of the SEAC, it's foreign to a lot of people because this is a fairly new position. It began in 2005 and I'm only the fourth service member to fill the position. So when you start looking at the duties and responsibilities of the SEAC, it is a very, very fine line. And it almost looks like what the chairman does, what he can and cannot do. Because there's different authorities that derive from the services, the man, train and equip responsibilities. That is not what I do. That's not what the chairman does. But what we do is we're integrators. We're global integrators that get that entire total joint force to execute the mission. And we have a very, very special relationship with our combatant commands across the globe to make that happen. Now, some of my focus areas, uh, total four fitness is one of them. And you get to see these things that the fingerprints are all across the services. If it's joining nature, then it's in my wheelhouse with the help of my counterparts on the services. Because each service approaches things a little bit different. So you have to be able to tailor your approach to each one of them. Okay. So total force fitness, that is just the whole encompassing nutrition, uh, spirituality, readiness, fitness, you know, uh, mental well-being and so on. And it's just a, a, a cycle 
of well-being that we have to ensure for every single member. So I'm heavily involved in that. One of the other things that I'm heavily involved in is brain health. I am a TBI patient. And I, I, as a, as I'm currently undergoing training still. Uh, I keep banging my head and uh, I don't know why, but ask Janet and she'll tell you a different story. She's been trying to keep me from banging my head. But, uh, you know, I, I am part of an executive council right now that is looking for better ways to go in and assess brain health and PTSD for that matter. And breaking this stigma to getting members to seek help. By the time I sought help, it was almost too late. And it was out of personal pride. And I had to put all of that stuff aside and sit, sit down with a total stranger and tell them how weak I was on certain things. And it was that total stranger that ended up lining me up with a bunch of other strangers that ended up giving me the key to continue to be functional. The difference between me and people that are undergoing in residence programs is that I found a way to function and it didn't stop me. I was able to, compart uh, to compartment things and still <laughs> press forward. But man, when I was in my darkest of days, things were not good and things were not right. So finally, with the help of Janet and a few of other people, I was able to go ahead and get the help that I needed. And here we are today advocating for it. So it brings a little bit of credibility to that. Another big thing that we're working is diversity and inclusion. We know that after the killing of George Floyd, uh, there was a huge uproar on the nation mm -hmm. regarding our long history of racism, prejudice and inequality. So I'm working closely with the Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary Barrett, and a group of uh, executive directors to be able to make sure that we have an enduring commitment to not only breaking the practices that are still in place, the unconscious bias, the microaggressions, you know, the subconscious uh, prejudice against all of our demographics to make sure that every person has got an equal chance to ascend to the highest of positions. On the enlisted side, we're not doing all that bad. Take the Air Force as an example right now. Well, Army and Air Force Exchange, so we'll take the Air Force and the Army. So the Sergeant Major of the Army, half black, half white. You know, me as the SEAC, Latino. The new incoming Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Asian. The outgoing Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, black. And the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Space Force, white. That is defined right there. That's what diversity looks like at the top levels of the institution. On the officer side, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. So we're working with key decision ma uh, makers across the services, across the industry, across the agencies, and in the private sector to make sure that we do not get it wrong. I mean, sure that once again, the Department of Defense is in the leading edge of leading change for our nation. And we have done it several times. Look at our history, you know, from segregation to everything else, how we have been the test case for implementing things and then society catches up. This is an opportunity for us to do that once again. So I'm part of that council. And then lastly, another example here, this is just in the first six months again, uh, the joint PME reform. So we're gonna go ahead and keep joint, uh, senior list joint PME one and two as uh, online resources, but we need to tweak them a little bit. We need to make them a little bit user friendly and more pointed. The other thing that we're, gonna, that we're gonna do is institute another pilot course, which we're tentatively calling it Gateway, which is an in-residence joint PME for about a week to two weeks for select E6s and E7s to be able to join, to learn how the joint machine works. And then after that, we have Keystone, which is the, the pinnacle of uh, PME courses for senior enlisted members. But that comes too late. Pinnacle, or I'm sorry, Keystone, typically does not happen for enlisted members until the 24th, 25th year in service. So we need to go ahead and bridge that gap from uh, a staff sergeant or an E5 or an E6 taking the joint PME and then having that huge gap for about 10 years before they actually attend some other kind of joint PME. So we wanna place something in the middle. So I'm working heavily with, uh, with that particular initiative. And then we have a myriad of other things that haven't materialized just yet. But that has been my focus in the first six months. Wow. Well, I do have a, a follow-up question. Just uh, you, you talked about some of your your uh, your efforts here, and of course, we've posted we posted the website, the JCS.mil website, where you could actually look up uh, the CX line of efforts on there. You know, uh, solidifying the values and purpose of the office of the CX, develop the joint force, ensure readiness. N number three, build global partnerships, and four, um, uh, take care of people and families, for those of you out there that want to read up more on that. 
But see, I, I, have, I do have a question, right? So I, I've been in the military 22 years now, I think 23. And, you know, with, with regards to diversity, inclusion, racism, I don't think, to be fair, in the calm world, I don't think I've ever felt anyone being overtly racist. Uh, uh, microaggression, maybe. Maybe I deserved it sometimes, right? Maybe they were hard on me because I deserved it. In your, in your career, did you ever feel there was a time when someone may have been racist towards you or, or showed some type of unconscious bias or microaggressions or anything of that nature? No, I, absolutely. Yeah, and I will be a, a liar and dishonest if I didn't say that it happened. Uh, there were several times, you know, when I was a young airman at one striper before I lost that stripe, um, I had the drive. I wanted to be a better airman and I wanted to be involved in the community. And I try out, I tried out to be one of the proffers for a dining out. And I was told to pack sand because my English was so bad that they didn't want me doing it. So, I mean, part of it is factual because you really don't want somebody that you need subtitles in the back to be able to explain what the hell they're saying. But the other thing was that I realized that I had shortcoming there that I needed to overcome. So I ended up taking it upon myself to go ahead and practice and get better and get better at it, to be able to go ahead and uh, speak clearly. Then when I became a pararescue man, you know, that was one of the things that I always had to practice twice as hard before I gave any briefings. Because as a staff sergeant PJ, I was briefing two-star generals on personnel recovery, search and rescue plans. And I couldn't get it wrong because the credibility of the organization rests on my shoulders at that moment for those five to 10 minutes. So I had to make sure that I did not get it wrong. Uh, several other times when I went into pararescue training, I was told, hey, your kind typically doesn't make it through this school. And the reason that was said was because there was only two other Latinos in the entire 678 man inventory. And there was only one black guy. And there was another black guy in my class by the name of David Goggins that many of you may know from his book, Can't Hurt Me, that he left the, the training because there was uh, some other uh, issues that he was facing that uh, basically broke his motivation, but he's pretty articulate on it in, in the book and the regret that he had for living at that time and place. But then he ended up slaying his demons by going out to bucks. But even then, you know, us being the minorities in there, I mean, you can pick us out from a lineup. And even the team cartoons from, from that time, because you had to do a cartoon every morning. So you had a whole bunch of white cones and then you had a, a brown one and then you had a black one at some point. And so those are like microaggressions that actually, you know, it's a depiction of the reality, but the, the, the method of delivery wasn't really quite clean, if you know what I'm saying. But there have been other situations to where, you know, I was called certain names and everything else. And I was even made fun of my accent. You know, and I was having a conversation with some young officers uh, last night, the assume, and they asked me, well, how do you deal with people making fun of your accents? And I asked them one, one simple question. I was just, all right, look at look that person in the eye and ask them, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> and wait for the answer and then rest your case. All right. We're different. You know, we have the really, we come from different places. But biologically, there's only one race, and that is the human race. And that's something that we need to keep in the back of our minds. We come from different places, and a lot of these things are created by humankind. You know, we decided to segregate ourselves by Asians, Africans, Europeans, and everything else. But biologically, the human race is the only race. So we just need to embrace that, and we need to go ahead and cohabitate, and we need to make sure that by the time people come into our service, that they realize that there is no place for that. The chairman of the Joint Chief just put it, there is no place for racism and prejudice in the Department of Defense. And we do not tolerate that. So, but those are just a few examples on how we're dealing with this. But I am the, the sole enlisted member in that executive panel and I report directly to Secretary Barrett. And we had a great conversation just yesterday afternoon about the way ahead. And I'm really optimistic that this is not gonna be another down day. This is not gonna be another program that is forced down your throat. These are gonna be actions that are gonna make a difference, not only to make sure people understand what we do not tolerate, but also to show people that we're gonna hold those accountable that violate our human rights in military service. So that's the direction we're going. Diak, by the it way, sounds hey, and, and by the way, uh, I'm in no way, shape endorsing Dave Goggins book. He's got his own thing going. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, hey, it's okay. We, pro oh, we probably good. sell it in our stores. I'm not sure. We probably online. <laughs> but we get it. We get it. There's no, there's no endorsement. We'll ask you about your reading list here towards the end because we see a lot of stuff in the background. So yeah, we'll yeah. ask you about that a little bit later. No, see, so I get sound. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It sounds like you're really busy. You have a lot of initiatives you're working on. Has the pandemic and self-isolation changed how you engage in your leadership role? And how has that changed? Uh, since uh, the pandemic? Well, I've always, I've always been on the mindset that the environment cannot drive your motivation and your purpose for what you are there to do. You always have to find a way. And I have always been uh, pretty good at tailoring my approach to making things, uh, to making things work and discard the, the excuses, you know, the, the, this is why I can't do this. I always try to find out this is how I can go ahead and do this. So that has always been my method. So we always look at what we need to do. We look at all the possibilities, you know, virtual has been a great savior for a lot of us because we're still able to do certain things. And ask yourselves right now, I mean, why didn't we do this two years ago where we went virtually and started getting groups together and talking about things? The technology was there, but we didn't use it. Why? Because we didn't have a reason. So adversity, once again, ended up forcing us to think deeply and broadly into the things that we're not experiencing or the things that we need to go ahead and evolve into. Um, and then the other thing is just to make sure that, you know, again, when we raised our, our right hand and, you know, swore the oath to defend the Constitution, support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that that doesn't stop regardless of whether the world's falling apart. As a matter of fact, it's designed to make sure that the world doesn't fall apart. And we cannot take that lightly. So for anyone out there that is struggling, trying to find a way, uh, there are certain things that you can do to go ahead and make your, yourself purposeful even in the midst of pandemic, social distancing, teleworking and other things. There's ways to go ahead and get information across because 90% of the things that we do is making sure that the right information gets to the right person and decision maker and then follow it up with action. We can still do that to a great extent. So I encourage people to just go ahead and follow suit on that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Siak. So leading to the next question before, before I get to it, Colonel Fortier was the one that sent an email to your team. You remember Colonel Fortier? Yes. <laughs> a character. He's a character. I love him, though. I love him. He's retired now. He just retired. And he does work downstairs at the exchange. So he told me a story. And he says, you probably don't know about this. But they were, uh, you know, he worked at AFRICOM over there in Germany. And all the Army people were about to run PT. They had a PT session. They were going to run PT. You come out there in, in, in an IBA with your camos on. He can't remember you had sneakers or boots on and they're doing like a, um, a, um, a three to four mile run. And he says, you come out there and you just, you know, he's running, running around circles around them doing cadence and everybody's pumped up. They're like, oh man. And at the end, he says, you don't think you know this. He says at the end, all of the officers and you know, the, the senior enlisted, they were like, man, that's, that's our senior enlisted advisor right there. That's him, that's, that's our guy. And then uh, some of them were like, Hey, we can't let him beat us no more. This is, this is not, <laughs> we, we, you know, we got to show out. We got to step up our PT game. So with that, you know, we know you have to stay fit to fight. Why does that mean so much right now? And what's your fitness regimen, especially during the pandemic? And how are you staying in shape? Well, it's, it's always been a habit. So I've always been a pretty active kid. You know, I grew up pretty poor in Puerto Rico. I did have a bicycle. My bicycle was my method to get to plenty of places. And we'll get back to the bicycle here because that, that became a critical, uh, a critical mechanism in my life to stay in shape and to go ahead and escape. But I always liked running. I always liked playing sports. And, you know, when I became a pararescue man, I was afforded two hours every morning to go ahead and do my PT because it's part of the regimen for the expectations of a PJ to execute their mission. So that those things actually developed over time in my lifetime to go ahead and create the right habits. And now if I don't PT in the morning, I'm a cranky SOB. And uh, I'll tell you that <laughs> Jeanette Masters, the chief that works with me, she will look at me in our morning mirror and she'll be like, you didn't PT this morning, did you? And uh, so they know, I mean, I, I, I wear on my sleeve, but, uh, I've always been 
very aggressive when it comes to my approach. Uh, the things that I love to do, first of all, I love boxing, I love mountaineering and rock climbing, and I love mountain biking. Janet and I love to hike. We have hiked all, all around the world. And, you know, I like lifting and doing other forms of cardio. And in my basement right now, I have the small place, this dungeon that I call the House of Pain. So I have a 120 pound heavy bag down there. I have a bow flex, some dumbbells and some CrossFit equipment. And I go in there and kick my own butt for an hour and a half every morning, you know, before I go and report to the Pentagon at seven o'clock in the morning. So I get up right around 3.55, 04 in the morning, wake up for a little bit, shake it off, take my supplements and then get down there and uh, bring, bring on the pain. Um, it's always been important because since basic training, that aspiration that I had for leadership, I knew that there was that first impression that, that always comes before that. And that is the door to your credibility. The way that people see you actually says a lot about you, about your self-respect and about your loyalty to the rules of the service. Because the service is pretty strict when it comes to what is expected of every single one of us. So now, when it comes to the scenario with the army, there are a lot of young people out there that are looking for excuses not to get out on PT and do other things. So the reason I go with utilities and boots, yeah, they were boots, not, uh, not running shoes, and some kind of weight vest or a flak vest, is because I want to take those excuses out of their mind. You know, and I wanted to look at me with the knowledge frost that I have now for hair. Um, hey, the old man is out there and, and getting after it. How dare I do not? And I don't have to tell him, hey, you need to get in shape. I'm demonstrating why it's important to stay in shape because motivation is one of the biggest foundations of leadership. You have to make sure that you're motivating people when you speak, when they see you, when you present yourself as a professional, and most importantly, when you care for them. That is how you create that cycle of excellence that is suspected of every single one of us, especially when we become NCOs. So that is why I got out there and, uh, and did the PT always in the boots and nudes. And it was also uh, a silent homage to all of my fallen comrades in combat from all across the services. So whenever there's a five or a 10 carrying, even an IUD in the middle of the summer in the heat, always went with that just because that is just my way to go ahead and sweat a, a few pounds of, uh, of water for the blood that they shed for our nation. And uh, I, never, I never take that line. And the last thing that I will say on that is that look at the stats and look at the numbers. In the Department of Defense, we have only lost three uniform members to COVID. Many have gotten sick, but they're surviving. And why is that? Because of the healthy population that we have. The few that have perished had underlying medical conditions that they could do nothing about. But for those who are getting on the unhealthy side, go ahead and get on the right side of the equation and start doing things, eating well, exercising, to make sure that you create the immune system that is required for anything else that life is gonna throw at us. Because COVID-19, there's probably a reason why there's a number next to it. There's probably 20, 21, 22, and so on. So be ready for it, just like we are right now. And just, you know, promote that healthy lifestyle, just to make sure that we're ready, available, and then lethal. Those are the three things that we need to do. That's awesome. Andy. I could I could tell you, I could tell you what, Asiak, you did win the hearts and minds of those soldiers that day, because Colonel Fortier told me himself. <laughs> So eating well goes hand in hand with fitness. What does nutrition look like for you? And why are initiatives like Air Force Smarty Fueling and Army Healthy Communities so important? Well, so I have to admit first, first of all, that every once in a while I'm a garbage disposal, but that is just because <laughs> I have I have the the metabolism of a of a 19 year old. And I, I guess I'm blessed with it. But uh, I will tell you that my wife doesn't like to cook processed foods from sauces to everything. I mean, she tries to do everything natural. We eat pretty well in our home. And I'll 90% of the time I pack my lunch, you know, whatever leftovers I had, I bring that in there. Uh, I don't need anything prior to seven o'clock. Like last night, I didn't get that Zoom call done until probably like uh, 20 hundred. So I didn't eat until late, but that's because I was starving. I wasn't about to go to bed hungry. But typically on a good day, I don't need anything past seven o'clock at night. Um, it's very important 
that the services and the department, much like you're doing right now with the initiatives, provide healthier options for people. Because for the reason that I just stated about being up late in that Zoom call, we have a lot of people, young people right now that are working shift work. And you get to see it with our military police and other personnel that don't have that much time to be able to sit down somewhere and get something to eat. So you see them park their patrol car at the shop and they come back with a couple of uh, Otis Bunker Meyer muffins and then a bag of chips and then a sandwich from that refrigerator that's been there for probably two years. That's not good for them. So the more options that we have for them to be able to go ahead and eat healthy, the better. And we got that question, you know, via Facebook about the subway shutting down. And I know that you guys are looking into it, but people are paying more attention to the options that are on base. And I don't know if you recall back a few years back when General McChrystal shut down all the Burger Kings and everything else in Afghanistan, because he didn't feel that that was good for the readiness of the force. So we're cognizant and we're very vocal about it. And if somebody's out of shape and out of weight, the first conversation that I have with them is about what is that they're eating? Because it doesn't matter how many push ups sit-ups and everything you do that. If you have the input that is coming into your body, it's not conducive to go ahead and create the fuel necessary and burn that fat out of you. And you can potentially be just basically swimming against the tide and eventually going backwards. So it, it is very important for everyone to go ahead and decode some of the calories that they take the composition of those foods, and then what is it that they're trying to do to either, you know, get fit or lose weight. Awesome. Thank you for that. It's been a challenging year for many of us. So many people are looking for light at the end of the tunnel. Sir, how do you stay resilient and grounded during tough times? So when I went through parachute training back in 1995, mm -hmm there was a mechanism that was taught to us to be able to break the fall of a static line jump. Now, for those not, not familiar with static line jumping, the parachute opens, you have very little control of it. And the only thing that you can do is turn a certain way and break the fall when you land. Break the fall or you're potentially breaking a leg or your neck for that matter. And that is called a P PLF, a parachute landing fall. And it's designed to go ahead and minimize the blow that you know is coming. So in my own mind, I created my own little acronym with PLF. I'll do a PLF on that, you know, and that is uh, mm -hmm. purpose, laughter, and family. So when things keep going tough, and when I feel that I'm at the end of, uh, of my rope on things, I always think of those things. Do I have a purpose? Yes. Can I laugh at things? Yes. Is my family still appreciated and loving? Yes. And all of a sudden, man, all worries go away. Um, and again, it's just associating the things that I have learned throughout my career and the things that are most important to me right now and how they can go ahead and give me strength when I'm feeling weak. So that's, uh, that's what I do. That's good. So, well, thank you so much. I got. I just had to write that down. PLF, left, right? Purpose, laughter, and family, and kind of the yeah. questions that that yeah. you you asked there. So, check this. Out. I'm at a I'm at a AFSA conference. I don't know, like 2013, 2014, or 15. I don't remember. And there's this picture of you. I don't know if you were in an AFSA magazine or an AFSA pamphlet. It it was something crazy like that. Somebody was like, oh, oh, that's uh. At that time, I think you were a chief. It was like, oh, that's Chief CZ. He's cool. He's cool. And then they they brought up this thing called carnivore leadership but back then you know I was younger I was like I, I don't know I was like a master sergeant tech sergeant I was like I don't know what, what okay uh, what is that you know and I never got a chance to actually hear it so I know I know that you're known for your leadership style and your refusal to accept mediocrity so for those of us that don't know what is carnivore leadership well to simplify carnivore leadership is nothing more than a mindset and a primer for action and what I mean by that is throughout my career, I have always had, you know, books that I always keep writing thoughts on, you know, lessons learned, good and bad, you know, things that my leaders, the people that I respect have said that resonated with me. And I keep a collection of all of those thoughts. And when I wrote the first volume, The 20 Silver Bullets, that's really what it was all about. You know, I was a brand new command chief at Herbert Field. And I got to see all kinds of different tribes, you know, from the maintainers to the cops, services, logistics, and everybody had their own little culture. But there was one subculture within AFSA that and that was like, hey, everybody here is, a, is an air commando 
that I needed to capitalize on and I needed to reel them in so that they can start, you know, they, they could start working as teammates. So that's why I wrote the silver bullets. It's like, hey, this is what is expected of us. And this is what I have learned while I've been on the road. And I want to go ahead and pass that on to you. And then I want us to practice these things, put them into action to become a carnivore leader and then create other carnivore leaders to go ahead and start training generation after generation and creating the right habits for the excellence that we demand from every single one of our airmen. So that's why I started writing those things. And then every single one of those papers, you know, there's five volumes out there, but every single one of them was tailored a specific time and place in our Air Force. You know, when the evaluations were changing, I wrote one about that. When people were getting kicked out because of PT, I wrote one about that. Um, you know, acceptance, you know, duties and responsibilities, I wrote about that. When we were two years into the evaluation system and we still had the naysayers, I wrote a paper about that, about, hey, get with the program. So it was just a message that it was actually written to be appreciated anywhere from the E1 to the O6 to understand, you know, at the bottom of the spectrum was for them to realize, hey, this is what is expected of every single one of you. At the top of the spectrum was pretty much, hey, this is what we leaders expect of you when it comes to accountability, when it comes to these things. Don't let them fall astray on your watch. So it was a pretty broad message for people. And I was asked last night, how come you haven't written a volume for a while? And candidly, it's because I haven't been around troops. You know, ever since I've been, you know, at the NAF and then AFRICOM and then here, I mean, it's been a pretty strategic environment where I'm dealing with a lot of SESs and flag officers. And I don't see a value of writing a leadership paper for them. What motivated me to write those things were the people, the people that were asking for it. So for the audience out there, if there's anything that you're interested in when it comes to carnival leadership and you have any topics, please bring them forward and I will do my best to go ahead and deliver something for you. But you are the fuel that goes ahead and ignites my fire. And without you, man, I can't write. So help me out. See, like, where, where could people find the... the you said it's five volumes. Is there a website? Is it on your JCS site? Where could they find these volumes? Is there? Do you have a, a, a you or Facebook, another Facebook page, or some website to where they, people can find these volumes? So we do. We do have a Facebook page, and uh, we can uh, definitely hang them in there. And I know that if you send me an email direct, you can also get them from me. And then if you get them from me, we can engage in a conversation too about what is it that you really need, because I'm here for every single one of you all 2.4 million of you and uh you know you know 2.4 million 24 hours in a day start doing the math to see uh, you know, uh how we're gonna get to that but the reality is is that you know if, if we're not putting our best foot forward to go ahead and answer you know the the call from our people the request for help or to be better I, we fail as leaders so yeah so some people don't realize that the exchange is part of the Department of Defense, and we're celebrating 125 years of service this month. We were formed back in 1895 to protect troops from scam artists on the American frontier. That's a fun fact for you. So, um, so ever since the exchange, uh, we've we've gone where the troops go. So can you talk about a time or two where we supported you during your career? Well, I think I have to go back naturally to both my time in Iraq and Afghanistan, because in the most remote of places, I remember when Bagram was still a moon dust palace, no <laughs> roads, no buildings, just tents and everything else. And when the AFIS 10 came about, it was a little piece of home. Same in Iraq, you know, we ended up getting just that little thing to be able to go there, you know, go, go to a certain place and get a coffee, then go in here and get the shaving cream that I don't know why well, we weren't shaving, but that's just an example. We I mean, had a beer down to here, but uh, just a little things that you found there. And then you just kind of like, you know, the smells, the sights, the sounds, everything else that you were able to get in there. Um, it's, it's just a little piece of home. So it's always comforting just to see that in there. And the staff in AFIS, I have to say that, uh, you know, phenomenal. You know what I mean, you treat the, the, uh, the troops with respect. And uh, I have never had a bad experience uh, with AFIS. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for that. That Our team will really appreciate those words. Thank you. It's, it's the truth from the bottom of my heart. 
Excellent. Thank you. Siat Colon Lopez, you're getting incredible reception on our live feed. I just want to take a second to share some of the comments. Michelle says, I love how he deals with life's ups and downs. Pretty amazing guy. Jose says, great advice. Lots of people are watching and they're, they're giving you likes and loves. Ryan also says, I'm digging the Air Force guitar in the background. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, well, let's, let me show, let me show it to you. Hold on one second. Let's, let's, well, let's play. By the way, so I learned this term here pretty soon. A lot of people, when I was doing the Zoom things, they were wondering if I was Winnie the Pooh in it, you know, and no, I'm not. <laughs> I am fully in uniform. You do, you do have a request, Siak. Somebody asked if you could play the Star Spangled Banner. It is his favorite Motley Crue song. What? Is that true? <laughs> is that true? Oh, gosh. I think, I think it's going to press the Scott Key with uh, Motley Crue. Let's, are we going to hear it? Are we going to hear it? No, no play? <laughs> He's like, no. He's like, no play. We're not playing that today. That's a sweet guitar, though. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, no, so, you know, it's, it's a gift from, uh, from a couple of your friends. But uh, yeah, so I learned to play guitar back in 2005 after I returned, uh, returned from my third deployment. And uh, I had a, a little bit of a struggle and a buddy of mine, you know, recommended I did it. Janet actually always wanted to learn to play guitar. She was the first one that mentioned it, my wife. But I decided to just go ahead and buy a guitar and uh, teach myself how to play. So now whenever we're traveling US old wow. tours and everything else, I get up with the band and play whatever they're playing. So it's fun. It's a lot of oh, fun. Wow. Yeah. It's awesome. Wow. And, and I have to point out that Christiane is a hell of a singer. So <gasps> oh, you know, she's, she's quietly in there. But uh, yeah, she 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 can sing. Are you two a duet? Like you play the guitar and she sits there and sings? We yeah. haven't yet. We haven't yet. Yeah. We should we should sometime. <laughs> Oh, I see another Facebook engagement coming. <laughs> All right, Christiane. Hey, tune in next week for the SEAC, Colon Lopez and Christiane oh, as they play. Oh, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Hey, hey SEAC, so I'm a, I'm a first style alumni, and so I'm very familiar with Herbert Field uh, and AFSOC, and I love, I love being stationed there, and that mission is freaking amazing, and the beaches ain't too bad either over there. And uh, I'm also a fan of carnivore leadership because I love steak, chicken, and all the rest of that other stuff. And I also <laughs> love to lead as well. So, uh, but before we say goodbye, is there anything else you'd like to share with our service members and the families watching today? No, well, you know, for everybody that has come, uh, come up and listened to this, uh, to this podcast, I, I would just like to say thank you. And we we'll really appreciate your time. I know that it's kind of like in the middle of the day and, you know, a lot of you have things that you need to do, but I'm uh, I'm aware that this is going to be recorded and posted. I know that Christiane is probably tracking, and uh, we'll be able to go ahead and present it later. But uh, I would like to leave you with uh, two thoughts, and that is that only the mediocre are always at their best. So never pass up a good opportunity to go ahead and train to continue to improve yourself every day, even in this position as the top enlisted airman or the top enlisted service member that happens to be an airman, uh, man, I'm always learning. I learn from you, I learn from other people, my teammates, and so on. So never quit learning. And then the last thing when it comes to this whole diversity and inclusion conversation, for anyone out there listening, you deserve what you tolerate. Don't tolerate people making the off-color jokes. Don't tolerate people uh, demeaning others just because they look different or they speak different or because they dress different. You know, embrace diversity for what it is. And that is the strength of our nation. That is why America is so strong because we have taken lessons learned from many places and we created this thing that is wet, white, and blue. Those are the three colors that matter. That makes us who we are. And that has created the worst, I mean, the best superpower and the worst nightmare for our enemies. So please just embrace who you are, respect the flag and continue to serve honorably. And, uh, from the chairman, the secretary, and myself, uh, we care for you. We're here for you. So please use us to your advantage, all right? Because you actually are the advantage of the nation. Man, that, those are some awesome words, awesome words. So so I'm looking forward to, to being in this position for the next uh, three years or so. And I would love for you to come down to Dallas, Texas and visit our associates and our staff here. Uh, but when you get here, uh, I'm gonna break down this printer 
paper box and me and you gonna have a dance off or uh, something to that effect. Cause I heard, I, I saw some stuff floating on the internet and uh looked like you got some moves. I, where, where'd that originate from? Oh man, Christiane, did you put them up to this? <laughs> she did not. I she can either not. confirm nor deny it came from an anonymous source. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I got to do my own research here. Yeah. No, so uh, before we get into that, so uh, Chief uh, Kevin Osby, uh, congratulations, you know, and welcome to the AFIS team and to my uh, my women, Chief Luis Reyes. Man, thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. And uh, AFIS is a better place because of your leadership and the leadership of your peers out there. So you're going to be missed, but you're going to be doing great things in Florida, my man. Be careful. That's a hot spot for COVID, but then again, so is Texas, man. So I'm <laughs> sure you get BCS anytime soon. Now to the break dancing. So I mentioned that I was pretty poor when I was growing up, man. A cardboard didn't cost, cost nothing, and somebody always managed to have music. So I picked up break dancing when I was a little kid. You know, I was just a tiny little thing, little little boy. You know, always wiry. And uh, <laughs> so we're in Poland. And doing a USO sh uh, show and, uh, you know, we get done playing the whole thing. And right before the show began, this one uh, private uh, comes up and starts talking trash and challenges me to, uh, to a dance off. And I'm like, come on, man, really? You're picking on me? Out of all these people, mm -hmm. you're picking on me. Am I an easy target? And uh, he's like, oh, no, you and I, we're going to do this. I was just like, all right, man, I'll, I'll take that. So... Here are the rules, you know, two minutes, one move. You go first, I go second. Fair? All right. So he gets in and he does this little thing. It was kind of cute. And then I just I was like, man, this is going to hurt. But, you know, I'm going to teach this young buck a lesson here. You know, never judge a book by its cover. So I get down and I bust out a windmill. Man. <laughs> what I was expecting that from a, from a 48 year old man. But, you know, I pay the man for the next 72 hours, man. I was freaking <laughs> bang game myself up. But, you know, lesson learned, you know, for the young man, it's just like, hey, man, look, you know, be careful which star you knock on if you don't know what's behind it. So but it's all good. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you, you don't have to worry about me challenging you to anything below the waist down. So below the waist up, I can tick, I can tick, I can talk, I can do all that other stuff. But when it comes to windmill and all that stuff, yeah, you, you got that one. Uh. <laughs> hey, C.I. Colon Lopez, thanks again for spending time with us today. It has truly been an honor to talk with you. We appreciate you and your support for the Airmen, Soldiers, Sailors, and Marines. Thank you for all you do for our great nation. We're humbled that you came on to chat with us. Thank you so much. Please stay on real quick for a couple minutes after we go off live. Yeah, Thanks no, again. thank you. Thank you so much, guys. And you know, this has been a lot of fun. You know, this is this has been great. And anything that we can do for you, please let us know because we want you to keep on taking care of the troops. So thank you for everything you do. And uh, Lee and Julie, thank you so much too. It's a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Oh, same to you. Thank you very much for your time. We we loved having you. You are a fantastic guest. You are great. Thank you so much. All right, Ben. Thank, thank you. you much. Bye, you guys. We're going to stop the stream. Dallas out. <laughs> Dallas out. Peace.